Sometimes relationships are tough, aren't they? It can be difficult to navigate expectations. What does this person really want from me? And you know, it can be a lot the same with our faith. Maybe sometimes you felt like, man, do this, don't do that. Can I really do this? What does Jesus really expect from me? And is it possible to really fulfill his expectations? You know, these questions and more we're going to examine today in our fourth message in our series, Questions Jesus Asked. Oh, I tell you, it's a tough question that he asked today, but I believe it will encourage you. And we're going to even examine the love language of Jesus. I hope you'll stay with me today. But before we get into it, let me just say welcome. If you are new, welcome to Oxnaz Online. Let me introduce myself. I'm Pastor Jody, and this is a digital church community. So we are so glad that you are here, that you're returning. And let me just say this. If you're interested, if you enjoy this time we spend together, check out our website later, oxnaz.ca. You can learn more about what it means to be part of a digital community. You can learn how you can plug in and join our daily devotions where we unpack this. You can learn how to give and support and all the things that we do. You can check that out later. So I encourage you. And we have, you know, three earlier messages in this series. So on our website, you can access them all. And don't forget, being a part of our digital community means we want to hear from you. We want you to engage. So like, share, ask questions, post your thoughts. Let us know what you think about this message as we go through it together today. So today we're going to hit the question right first thing. Jesus was teaching, he was preaching, he was healing, and in the middle of it all, boom, he hit them straight up with a very direct question. Jesus asked them, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Boom, right, he came right out with it. Why do you say, I'm your Lord, and not do what I say? So let's, let's unpack this together. He called himself, they were calling him Lord. What, what does that even mean? Well, to call someone, to call Christ Lord, it implies that he has dominion that he has control over your life, and that you have surrendered your life to him. So what he was in essence saying is, you, you folks, you're saying I'm your Lord. So that should imply my expectation would be that you've surrendered to me, that you follow me, that, that, that I have some dominion over you and, and authority. And yet, that doesn't seem to be the case because I'm talking and you ain't listening. It can kind of rub us wrong sometimes when we think of, well, he has control or I have to give someone authority. But, you know, this isn't super foreign to us. Think, of a, think about it like your work. When you go to work for that space and time in your day, you submit to the authority of your boss. If they say do this, you do this. If they say do that, do that. You don't always like it. You don't always agree with it. But when they're your authority, you follow what they say. And think about it if you've played sports. I mean, I, w I loved basketball. And my basketball coach, when I was at practice, he could tell me to do things that, man, I didn't want to do. Sometimes, if we weren't doing the things we were supposed to do, we had to w run wind sprints until we almost got sick. I mean, he was the authority. So in that space and time, we gave it to him and we followed his direction. I mean, this is part of our life. It's not super foreign to us. I mean, even think of someone in the military. I mean, if a commanding officer speaks, you listen and you listen now. And even you would have to lay down your life for your country. And that makes sense to us. So Jesus, I think, was kind of coming at them from this angle of, you know, you are saying that I'm in this position of authority over you, but you're not listening. And that's kind of an expectation that goes along with claiming that I am your Lord. So he said, why do you call me this if you're not doing what I say? But look at that question, because something else pops out really interesting to me. When Jesus said that, he didn't just say, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? Did you notice something? That's right. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Is that significant? Do you think that really means anything? Or do you think that's just what he asked? Well, I did a little bit of a study on that. 
And I realized there are times in scripture when Jesus used that, or when, sorry, God used that term, you know, he said, Abraham, Abraham, when Abraham was ready to offer Isaac um, on the fire, on the, on the, as a sacrifice, when he called him Moses from the burning bush, he said, Moses, Moses, when Jesus was teaching, remember that time when he was with Martha and Mary and Martha was all worked up and stressed and, and he said, Martha, Martha. So there are these times when we hear this repeated name calling. And, and so I looked into that and you might find it interesting to know that when he was saying that, it's because he would have understood that to repeat a person's name is this expression in Hebrew of intimacy. So now looking at that question, it kind of even becomes more un, you know, clear to us that he's saying, you're not only calling me your Lord as if I'm, I'm the one that you've surrendered control to, but you're saying this intimate kind of connected relationship that you have to me, and yet you don't even listen to what I say. Now that makes it even more interesting. And pulling that into where I began today, we have these expectations in relationships for how we act. And you know, I had some fun this week with some of you. I threw a poll out on my Facebook and I said, like, what do you expect from a relationship with your spouse? What do you expect from a relationship with your friend? And well, you guys gave me some fantastic answers. You can even throw down an answer in the comments. A lot of people said honesty, integrity, faithfulness, loyalty, love, kindness. Great, great things that you shared about your expectation in relationship. So as you think about what Jesus was saying, it's almost like he's putting it out there that there is this expectation that if you're saying that there's this intimacy, you're calling out to me, you're declaring me to be in relationship with you, even a relationship as your Lord and master, but yet, why do you not do what I say? So the question stands, why? I pondered this. Okay, Jesus, that's a great question. Why would they? Think about that for a minute. Why would they do that? And oh, as we look to his word, I think something kind of comes up to the surface. So let me read the greater context in Luke into where Jesus asked this question. You can read it on your screen and I'll look at it here. This comes from Luke chapter six, starting at verse 17. So it says, Jesus, he went down with them. He stood on a level place. There was a large crowd, it said, of his disciples that were there and a great number of people from all over Judea and Jerusalem and even the coastal regions of Tyre and Sidon. But look what it says. They had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Hmm. All right then, they, those who were troubled by impure spirits, it says were cured and all the people, they were trying to touch him because power was coming from him and he was healing them all. Hmm, do you catch that? I wonder if the reason why in this context they were saying, Lord, Lord, you know, I want to, to be healed. I want you to touch me, heal my son, my daughter. Cleanse me of this disease. Help me with this struggle. Ooh, do you think that's maybe why they were reaching out and calling him Lord? Maybe because they were looking for something from him? Ooh, that starts to feel yucky. But think about it in your own relationships. Do you ever get into relationships with people where you expected kindness, friendship, loyalty, and trust, and all they were looking for was something from you? I wonder if that's possibly one answer to the question. Why do you call me Lord, but you don't do what I say? Interesting. Was it just because they were looking for something from Jesus? So in this series, as we look at these questions, we're flipping them. So let's turn it to you. Turn it to me. Let's think about this question. If we were to imagine Jesus, in a crowd teaching us and us sitting there listening and all of a sudden he looks out and said, why do you call me Lord? Why do you kind of say that you follow me and, in, and kind of give this impression that we have relationship and, and yet you don't do what I say? What do you think is the answer? If you're one who's struggling with obedience today to follow the teachings of Jesus, why do you claim him to be your master and yet you don't listen to him? 
but you listen to your boss, you listen to the coach, you know, you listen to other people. You don't listen to him. And I begin to, to see within that question, I think a lot of people want Jesus in their life so they can feel security. They want to go to heaven. Maybe they claim him as Lord to please their parents. Maybe it's to give them some confidence that if they need help, they can pray and ask and he'll do what they need. But it's interesting to think about why we would claim this relationship with Jesus, but not meet his expectations. So what do you think about that? Let that sit with you. And then I'm going to show you something really neat. Okay, so we're talking about what Jesus said in Luke 6. This is known, this passage of scripture is a sermon on the plain. And it's very, very closely tied to a passage in Matthew, one of the most famous teachings of Jesus called the Sermon on the Mount. You can read that in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 to 7. Very similar to what Luke records here around chapter 6. The Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain. Now what's really interesting is in Luke, he ends it with this question, you know, why do you call me Lord? Lord, Lord, and not do what I say. But Jesus uses the same terminology, Lord, Lord, in a, not a question, but a statement when he completes the Sermon on the Mount. Let's look at it together. Jesus said, not question, I mean, he said it pretty clearly, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Do you hear that? That same terminology. Not everyone who says that will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty straight. I mean, Jesus was teaching them what it meant to follow him and then said, you can say it all you want, but if all you're doing is saying that I'm your Lord and Savior for something that you can think you can get from me, but you're not truly following me, then I don't know. You know, it reminds me of what Jesus' brother said. James said, you know, faith without works is dead faith. You show me your faith, I'll show you my faith by what I do. It's like when we truly have faith in Jesus, when we make him our Lord and Savior, we do what he calls us to do. We obey him, we follow him. So I think it brings us, if that's where you're at today, that's certainly where I'm at, it brings us to this question. Okay, obedience seems pretty clear cut. It is an expectation of our relationship with Jesus. Let me know, do you agree with that? I think the Bible is pretty clear. I think Jesus was pretty clear. So it brings us to this next question then, what must I do? I want to do then the will of the Father. I want to go to heaven. I don't want him to say, I never knew you. No, no heaven for you when I stand before him someday. So what do I do? And then I think we begin to get overwhelmed. There's so many preachers. There's so many teachers, so many doctrines, so much religion. I mean, this is a pretty big book and people teach it for years and oh, it just can become completely overwhelming. Guess what? Take a deep breath with me. I have great news for you. It isn't super complicated. What must I do? What is his will? I want to show you what Paul said. Get ready, because this is great news. Paul said this, the entire law is fulfilled in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Boom, I think that's like a mic drop. That's what Paul said, because they had the Old Testament and they took from the Old Testament the Ten Commandments and they made 1,600 or something commands out of them. What it really meant. They were all fetched up in the law. And, and Jesus what taught what it really meant. He said, you know, it comes down to loving God, loving other people. And then Paul just dropped it out and said, you filter everything that you need to do down. It's this simple. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I said it's this simple. What must I do? What do I have to obey? Loving others? It's not complex. This is summed up in loving God and loving others. That's why it's our mission here at Oxnaz Online. Our vision, our mission is to help you take your next steps in growing in love for God and other people. But while it's simple, it's not super complex, it is not easy. It is not easy. And 
yet it is what we need to do. So that's where we need to wrestle with what, what does it look like? So I want to share the words of Jesus. Let's look how, how Jesus put it. He said like this, I am giving you a new command. Now, it seemed like it was an old command because we knew that we were supposed to love God and love others. But he said this, love one another. This is the command of Jesus. You want to keep his laws? Boom, love one another. But look how he said it, as I have loved you, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And this will be how everyone knows that you're mine. It's like when they see your love, you're going to look like me. They're going to know that you're my children. Just like when I look at, at people on my Facebook today, I see kids and I look, oh, they look like their mom and dad that I knew 25 years ago at their age. We look like him. They were known to be his when we love each other. And he said, I'm going to show you. And love cost Jesus his life. Jesus loved you so much. He gave his life that you could be reconciled with God. And then it's this simple. Go and love him and love other people. Now you think, well, yeah, but the Bible says do this and do that and do this. And it's, what about all that, pastor? I think you're missing it. You're making it too simple. Think of what the Bible says. Okay, you might say, well, I know I'm not supposed to lie because the Bible says do not lie. Well, think about it for a minute. Why? Why not lie? If all you have to do is love one another, what's the big deal with lying? Lying hurts other people. When you lie to someone, I asked everybody, like I said, I asked you, what do you expect in a relationship? Honesty. When you lie, you break relationship. You hurt each other when you're not truthful and honest. So when Jesus, when these rules come in, that we have all these rules to follow, they, they boil down to how we honor and live out the love that Jesus has for us, the love that he showed us. We want to live that out for each other. And so I, I want you to look with fresh eyes at what Jesus taught about love. Because he said, I have, I have shown you, and this is what you need to do, love each other. And as you look at the Sermon on the Mount, that's my homework for you this week. Go and read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And you will see that the love that Jesus is teaching is not about the law. It's not about rules. It's not about, oh, I can't manage all these expectations. It's that he loved us and showed us how to love and called us to live in that kind of love for each other. And the love that he talks about in scripture, it's a love that goes further. You know, Jesus says, if someone asks you for your shirt, give them your coat too. If they ask you to go for a mile, go for two miles. It's a love, the, the love of Jesus is a love that goes farther. It lives purer. When, when the command said, do not commit adultery, Jesus said, you know, I care about your heart. I, I want you to honor each other. So if you look at each other with lust, man, I'll gouge, gouge out your eyes. <laughs> Yikes. Jesus was so committed that our love be pure, that he said it'd be better off to have no eye and get into heaven than to have both eyes but to be burning with lust. The love of Jesus, it shines brightly. We're a city on a hill. The light is meant to shine in the world so people could see and know him. The love that Jesus talked about, it gives. Why do we give? Do you give your money because God said you must give your 10%? Well, yeah, the Bible speaks about tithing. We give because it helps others, plain and simple. Love serves. Jesus wrapped a towel around his waist. He got in the dirt and he washed their feet. He said, I have set you an example. Do as I have done. Give as I have given. Serve as I have served. Care as I have care. This, uh, cared for others. This is what Jesus taught. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to call him our Lord. It means that we obey his command and it boils down to how we love him and love each other. And I'm gonna tell you friends, that love is salty. He said you are the salt of the earth. What does salt make you do? It makes you thirst. I wanna tell you a little story that's gonna help you understand what I mean by that. Author John Trent tells a story of Mark and Mitch. Now, he wanted to take this young boy named Mark to summer camp to help expose him to the love of Jesus. And so he was really hoping that, you know, through those great services, he would get to know that Jesus loved him and hear the gospel. 
But it's interesting, the leader of the camp, the chaplain that year, his name, they called him Mitch. Now he was in charge of all things at the camp. And what is interesting is that Mark tells the story of how he would watch Mitch not in service at the beginning, but he watched him in the kitchen. Now he would go into the kitchen, he would be working with the lady in the kitchen, and she looked tired. Man, it's a lot of work to cook for a bunch of hungry teenagers. But every time would Mitch would go talk to her to go over the menu and things, he would uh, stand and give her his seat. So they would discuss it, and then she would get up and go back to the kitchen, he'd sit back down. Now this intrigued Mark. That seemed very kind and compassionate. Well, the rest of the week went on, he did hear things in chapel, and kind of he began to be open to what Mitch said because he was really moved by how he treated this lady in the kitchen. Well, uh, sure as shooting, he felt that Jesus pull on his heart. He, he gave his life to Jesus, but in talking about it after, you know what he said? I wasn't convinced by the chapel services. I wasn't convinced by what Mitch said. I was convinced and I wanted to be like him. He said, when I watched him, I thought, if that's a Christian, I want to be one. Oh, that gives me goosebumps. He watched him and said, if that's a Christian, I want to be one. But how many times is it the opposite? We cry, Lord, Lord, but we don't love other people. And instead of people saying, if that's a Christian, I want to be one, they say, if that's a Christian, I want nothing to do. I'm going to hightail and run. You see, Jesus wants to shine through us. He wants our lives as we obey him and live in out our faith to attract people to him, to show what it means to love him as we love other people. And so maybe you're thinking, I, I want it, you know, I'm listening to you, Pastor Jody. I get it. Jesus wants me to love others. And, and that's, how I, that's how I need to live for him if he's my Lord and Savior. I get it, Pastor. I don't want to just, you know, go to heaven and, and just use Jesus. I, I really want to be one. But it's hard. It's hard to love other people. I mean, Jesus' love was so massive. And I just, I don't know if that's possible for me. I have some more good news for you. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit. It is when we give our life to Jesus and we are made new, our old heart is gone. He gives us a new heart and His Spirit comes to live within us and that's the spirit of love. And the more that we press into that, the more that we're not just taking His name, we're not just going to church, we're not just doing what He said, we're not just trying to fill all this the more that we truly love him and grow to know him and press into who he is and surrender the authority of our life to him, the more his spirit comes and the spirit of love fills us and equips us to love other people. That is how we truly are equipped to love each other. So we're going to end today with one last question Jesus asked. He stood before Peter after he was resurrected and he looked Peter right in the eye and he said, Peter, do you love me? Of course, Peter said, yes, I love you, Lord. Do you love me? He asked him a third time, do you love me? I wonder if we could imagine Jesus asking us that question today. Do you love me? Do you just say, Lord, Lord, hoping you'll get into heaven? Do you really love me? Because he said this, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. Whoever has my commands keeps them and is the one who loves me. Straight up, Jesus made it so clear, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. You can say you love Jesus. You can say he's your Lord. Do you really love him? Do you obey his commands? Because they boil down to this, love others. It seems so simple, but yet it's not easy. Our obedience is what shows Jesus we love him, and it means we need to rely on him. But I did say in the beginning, we're gonna talk about the love language of Jesus, and here it is. I think the love language of Jesus, the way in our relationship with Jesus that we speak love to him is through our obedience. Have you heard of the love languages? Well, back in the early 90s, if you haven't, uh, Gary Smalley 
found in is a counselor in couples relationships that we speak love kind of five different ways and I'm going to use two of them to give you a quick example here today. We can speak love through time, giving time to the person that we're in relationship with. We can speak love through words. But here's the thing that he showed in his teaching and in the books that he put out. If you speak the language that you understand, but it's not what they speak, it's like we're talking two different languages. If I was communicating that I loved you by spending time with you, but what you were looking for were words, then you're not getting it. I'm thinking, hey, I'm showing you I love you, and you're thinking you're not showing me you love me, but we're just on the wrong language level. Do you get it? So his love language uh, teaching was about if I understand that you need quality time, then I spend quality time with you. And if you understand that I feel love with words, then you speak words to me. And then we get it. We get that we're expressing love to each other. Now, well, let's bring that back to Jesus. He said, if you love me, I'm going to make this so easy for you, my child. It's going to be complicated when you look at all this. It may seem overwhelming, but here's the thing. If you love me, if you say you love me, if you call me Lord, do what I say. Obey me. Because my commands, Jesus is telling us, my commands aren't so that I'm the supreme authority and you're, I'm the boss of you and you do what I say. He is telling us to love so that we can be his hands and feet so that when someone is praying, God, I can't, I can't get through the day, I need help. He can send you to love them. He can send you to meet their need. He can use you to be his hands and feet to express his love to other people, to shine his light, the light of his love into the darkness. You see, he's calling us to be a people of obedience, not to tie us up and make us feel that we're not free. We're free. We obey him because his love is in us. His love fills us and the more it does, the more we just want to push it out to other people. Imagine a church like that. Imagine a church like that as we close today. Imagine what that would look like in the world. I think it would be a lot like Mark and Mitch. I think they would look at us and say, if that's a Christian, I want to be one. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? What does he want us to do? He wants us to love others. Do you love him today? Then I'm going to pray right now that God's Holy Spirit will equip you to love him and love others and that you will go from this message today not just going back to do the same old thing but you will begin to look at the way that you treat other people and constantly recognize it's a witness for Jesus in the world is it pointing people to him is it drawing people to him I hope it does I know it will if you really surrender to him and for anyone out there today who has just been kind of grabbing onto Jesus to get a little insurance for their eternity, I pray as much as it's a tough word, I pray you'll hear that word that Jesus spoke. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. Only those who do the will of my Father. Let me pray for you that God will equip you to walk in obedience to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and truth. I thank you for the example of love, Jesus, that you gave when you came to die for us. I thank you that by believing in you, by faith alone, we can be saved, we can be made new. But Lord, I recognize today that for everyone listening, that is a call to surrender our lives to your Lordship, to follow in the ways of Christ, which is a call to love. Love is simple, but it's not easy. So Jesus, I pray in your name that right now for that listener who is in this moment saying, Jesus, I want to love like that. I pray that your spirit will fill them, will change them, will transform them, that they will have an encounter with you that is powerful and supernatural. And you will so change their heart that it will just begin to spill out love on everyone around them, that we will become together these witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ that make others say, if that is a believer, man, I want to be one. Help us, Father, your church to be agents of the gospel of Jesus, of the truth and of life. God, I pray that you will change us and fill us and use us as your church. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. 
Oh God, we need you. Fill us with your love today. Amen. Amen. Do you love him? I hope this challenges you today. And next week, I invite you back for the final message in our series, Questions Jesus Asked. And if you missed any or the earlier messages, like I say, why don't you go back and check them out? Join us in daily devotions because we're going to unpack this together this week. And if you have been following as a regular member of Oxnaz Online, would you consider becoming a regular giver? Check out our website and, and look how God can use you to support this ministry that others can hear this truth. Others can. And be sure to share and like and follow and set notifications and all those things that make us an online community. Thanks for being with me today. I hope to see you next week. God bless.